This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate lecture on number theory, and it will be mostly about Euler's theorem, which is a generalization of Fermat's theorem. So we quickly recall Fermat's theorem has two forms. It can either say a to the p is congruent to a modulo p, or a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Here we take p as prime, and in the second case, uh, it must be co-prime to A. Um, and um, before giving Euler's generalization, I'm just going to give another application of Fermat's last theorem. To the, and we, what we're going to do is to show there are infinitely many primes with last digit equal to 1. And you can see there are lots of primes like this. We have 11, 31, 61, 71, 101, and so on. And um, we're going to show that this sequence goes on forever. This is a special case of Dirichlet's theorem, which says that if you've got any arithmetic progression, then there are infinitely many primes in that progression, unless there are obviously only a finite number. Um, so, Dirich so, so we're doing the special case of primes of the form 10n plus 1, and we, we, we first note that it's actually enough to show there are infinitely many primes of the form 5n plus 1, because uh, um, any odd prime of the form 5n plus 1 must be of the form 10n plus 1. So we can just do infinitely many like this, and this will be easier because 5 is a prime, as we will see in a moment. So to show there are infinitely many primes like this, um, we're going to use the following um, consequence of Fermat's, last, Fermat's theorem which says that if p divides um, a to the q minus 1, where p and q are prime, then either um, p is congruent to 1 modulo q, or a is congruent to 1 modulo p. And it's easy to get muddled up about this. Um, so. Um, the reason for this is we look at the order of A modulo P. And we notice that A to the Q is congruent to 1 modulo P. So the order must divide um, Q. You remember the order is the smallest positive power of A equal to 1, and it divides any other exponent such that um, A to the something equals 1. Well, since Q is prime, this implies the order is 1, or the order is Q. Well, if the order is 1, this means A to the 1 is congruent to 1 modulo P which means A is congruent to 1 modulo P, which was one of the conclusions we had up there. <coughs> In this case, if the order is Q, um, we know that the um, um, uh, P must be equal to 1 mod Q, because A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo P by Fermat, so Q must divide P minus 1 because the order divides this number. So this implies that um, P is common to 1 modulo Q. And you notice this is the other possible conclusion. Well, we're trying to find primes that are congruent to 1 modulo something, and this sort of almost gets us there. If we take a prime dividing this, then either it's one of the primes we want, or this other condition is satisfied. So we've got to somehow eliminate these ones. So what we can do is, is, is instead of looking at um, primes dividing x to the q minus 1, we are now going to look at primes dividing x to the q minus 1 over x minus 1. And... Um, this sort of tends to divide out primes of the form um, of the form what uh, of the form one modulo p, as as we will see in a moment. So um, let's go back to this and let's just take q equals five, because we're trying to find primes that are one mod five. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at primes dividing x to the 5 minus 1 divided by x minus 1 equals x to the 4 plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. So suppose p divides this. Well, p divides x to the 5 minus 1, so this implies that either um, p is congruent to 1 mod 5, which is what we want, or um, 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 or the, the other conclusion is that x is congruent to 1 modulo p. Well, if x is congruent to 1 modulo p, um, then this implies x to the 4 plus x cubed and so on, or 1, is congruent to 5 modulo p. But since we're assuming p divides this, So this means p divides 5. So, the, 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 so either p is congruent to 1 mod 5 or p is divisible by 5. Um, if we also take x so that 5 divides x, then obviously um, p does not divide x to the 5 plus x to the 4 plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. So we've got the following conclusion that if we take um, any number divisible by 5, so if 5 divides x and p divides x to the 4 plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1, then p is 1 modulo 5. Um, so um, we, we, we can, for example, um, just take x equals 5. And we find 5 to the 4 plus 5 cubed plus 5 squared plus 5 plus 1 is equal to 781. And this factors as 11 times 71. And you notice these both have last digit equal to 1 because they're 1 modulo 5 and they're odd. Um, so um, now all we do is, that, is to show that infinitely many primes of the form 1 modulo 10, all we do is we take 10x, so we take um, 10x to the 4 plus 10x cubed plus 10x squared plus 10x plus 1, and we take any prime p dividing this. Here x is the product of all primes we already know. And then we see that first of all, p must be congruent to 1 modulo 10 because we've seen it's 1 modulo 5 and it can't, or, or 0 modulo 5, and it can't be equal to 5 because we've put in a factor of 5 here, and it can't be 2 because we've put in a factor of 2 here. And secondly, we, we also see that x is not equal to a known prime. Um, so if we've got any collection of primes with last digit 1, we multiply them all together, multiply by 10, form this expression here, and take a prime factor of it, and this will give us a new prime with last digit 1. Um, you notice, by the way, that this is an utterly useless method of finding primes in practice, because, you know, if we take x to be, say, even something like 11, then already we're getting 100 to the power of 4, so we're getting 100 million or so, and we have to factorise that to find a new prime, which is obviously a really inefficient practical way of finding primes like this. However, it's really good as a theoretical method. It shows there are an infinite number. Um, so now we're going to look at Euler's generalisation of Fermat's theorem, and, and we want to look at, you know, what is a to the power of something modulo m? Um, so um, let's look at at powers of a modulo m. So we want to look at 1a, a squared, a cubed, and so on, modulo m. More generally, we might just look at the, the function taking x to a times x um, modulo m and try and wonder how it behaves. And let's just take m equals 12 and take a look and see what's going on. So, so the numbers modulo 12 are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And we're just going to draw a little arrow to show what happens if you multiply each number by two. So what we do is, well, zero times two goes to zero, one goes to two, two goes to four, four goes to eight, eight goes to 16, which gets us back to four, three goes, gives us to six, six goes to zero, and then 11 goes to 10, 10 goes to eight, um, nine, if we double that, it becomes 18, which is six. So if we look at this, what we see is, if we start with two, we end up with this loop here. Um, so if we take powers of two, um, we, we, we get up to two cubed, and then we get two to the four, which is equal to two squared, and then two to the five, which is equal to two cubed, and so on. So we've, we've got a sort of um, vague analog of Fermat's theorem, except that it says two to the power of four is now equal to two to the power of two. Um, so, so things are getting a little bit more complicated. Um, well, first of all, um, we can get a weak form of Fermat's last theorem. So if, if we're given a and m, then a to the x equals a to the y for some x less than y. This is congruent modulo m, I guess I should have said. And the reason for this is you just look at all the powers of a. So we start with 1, goes to a, goes to a squared, goes to a cubed. And there are an infinite number of different powers, different number of possible powers, but there are a finite number if we take the modulo m, because they're at most n of them. So two of these must be equal. So eventually we, 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 we must get um, some number a to the y that's actually equal to a to the x, because we've got an infinite number of powers of a, and we're trying to fit them into the finite number of numbers modulo m. So we've at least found, we can always find two different powers of a that are equal. Well, we can do a bit better of that. Suppose that A is co-prime to M, then A is invertible. So A to the X equals A to the Y, or congruent to A to the Y, implies that A to the Y minus X is congruent to 1 modulo M. So, um, so if a m equals 1, if a and m are co-prime, then a to the x is congruent to 1 modulo m for some um, x greater than 0. So that's a sort of, um, you see we've got now got weak forms of Fermat's theorem. So, so Fermat's theorem would say that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p, which would be a, a better form of this. And it says that a to the p is congruent to a modulo p. So this is stronger than saying that a to the x is congruent to a to the y for some x and y. And it's stronger than saying that a to the x is congruent to 1, because we've said explicitly what these exponents x and y are in, in the case of primes. So what we would like to do for Euler's theorem is, is to make it more precise and actually identify a, a, a good power of a that is equal to 1. Um, well, to see this, um, let's just look at the, 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 the case of m equals 13 to get an idea of what's going on. So um, let's take a equals 5 and look at powers of a. So we start by looking at powers of a. Well, we get 1, it goes to a to the 1, which is 5, then it goes to 25, and 25 is congruent to um, 12, and um, then 12 squared is congruent to 8, and 8 squared is congruent to 1. So we've got this little cycle of four numbers, 1, 5, 8, 1, 5, 12, and 8. So this is 1, a, a squared, a cubed, a to the 4, which is congruent to 1. Well, um, now let's try and um, see what, hap what multiplication by a does to other numbers. So we get 2 maps to 10, 
2 times 5 is 10, 10 times 5 is 50, which is congruent to 11, and 50 times 5 is 55, which is congruent to 3, and 3 times 5, we now go back to 2. And what other numbers are there? Well, there's 4, and 4 goes to 7, which goes to 9, goes to 6, which goes back to 4. So what we've got is we've got the, 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 the 12 numbers up to 13 are divided into these three cycles, where, where if, if, if we keep multiplying by 2, we go round in these cycles. So the numbers up to 12 can be written as a union of these cycles. We notice the cycles are disjoint. They're either disjoint or equal, and that's because A is invertible. So um, if the numbers, if, if these two cycles, if, if say two numbers there had to be the same, then obviously these two numbers would be the same, and these two numbers would be the same because we can multiply by A to the minus 1. So the cycles are disjoint or the same because A is invertible. The other key point is the cycles have the same size. Um, and to see they have the same size, we notice that this number here, um, this number here, for instance, is equal to 7 times a squared. Now, if, if this number were equal to this number, then we could divide by 7 and find that a squared was also equal to 1. So, um, if two numbers in any cycle are the same, then, then we can divide by one of the numbers and find the corresponding power of a must also be the same. And, and conversely, if, if some power of a is equal to 1, then obviously all cycles have at most, uh, at most that size. So what we have found is the, is the numbers, the numbers um, co prime to 13 mod 13 um, are a disjoint union. of cycles, and each of these cycles has size the order of the number 5. And since um, the, these numbers can be written as a disjoint union of cycles, we see that the order of 5 must actually divide um, the um, numbers, the, the, the number of numbers co-prime to 13. So, so we need them to be co-prime to 13 so that they have inverses. You remember in order to show the cycles um, were either disjoint or the same, we needed to actually take inverses of elements. So this doesn't work if you if you take elements that aren't co-prime to 13. Um, well, in the, what, what we see is that this works for any number other than 13. Um, so similarly, um, um, if a is co-prime to m, then the order of a divides this number phi of m, and phi of m is Euler's phi function. is It's the number of numbers co-prime to m. So, um, so we've now got Euler's theorem, which says that a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. And this follows because we've shown the order of a divides this. Here um, we must have a is co-prime to m, otherwise because we need to take inverses of a in this argument. And, and remember, phi is the number of things co-prime to, to m. So the special case of this is Fermat. If we take m equals p to be prime, then we see that phi of m is just m minus 1, because the numbers 1, 2 up to m minus 1 are the numbers co-prime to m if m is prime. Um, so this does indeed generalize Fermat's theorem. By the way, um, what we've done, we've actually proved Lagrange's theorem which says that if G is any group, well, what's a group? A group is something with a multiplication that's associative and it has an identity 
and it has inverses a a to the minus one equals a to the minus one a equals one um, so the um, numbers co prime to m have these two properties and the same argument shows that if g is a group and g is an element of the group g then the order of g divides the order of the um, sorry, the order of the element G divides the order of the group G. And exactly the same argument we've given works for this. And in particular, this implies that G, little the, the element to the power of the order of G is equal to 1 in the group G. Um, so um, let's look at um, um, some examples of this. Um, so let, let's just take m equals 1, 2, 3 up to 12 and take a quick look at um, the numbers co prime to m. So m equals 1 is easy. We've just got one number 1 modulo m, which we're going to take as either 1 or 0. And we notice that this, this number here just as order 1. If m equals 2, there's only one number co prime to, to m. And again, this number here is order 1 rather trivial so if m is 3 we get two numbers and um, which are co prime to m and their orders are as follows 1 is order 1 and 2 is order 2 obviously um, if m equals 3 so if m equals 4 I can't count we get these numbers 1 2 3 and 4 and now we've got to be a bit more careful because the numbers co prime to 4 are now 1 and 3 so we only get two numbers and we have um let's, let's write down what 5m is so 5m is 1 1 2 2 and again we find the orders of these elements are 1 and 2 so they both divide 5m so for m equals 5 we have 1 2 3 4 okay, i guess i should have put 0 in here and the numbers co prime to 5 uh, sorry i shouldn't put 4 in there i've got 0 the numbers co prime to five, oops, uh, 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 not zero. They're, they're one, two, three, and four. And these, this is order one, this is order two, and this is order four, because you can see that two squared is not one, but two to the four is 16, which is one, and similarly for three. And five m here is four, so again we see all these orders divide four. For m equals six, uh, the numbers are zero, one, two, three, four, and five, and this time, the, there are just two numbers co prime to six, which are one and five, and you can see the orders here are one and two. So five m is two, and again the orders all divide two. For m equals seven, we get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six numbers co prime to m, and now we have to start thinking a little about the orders. So one always is order one, six is minus one, so this is order two. We notice that 2 cubed is 8, so the powers 2 and 4 um, all of order 3. And 3 and 5 are left over and of order 6. So this is the case we wrote out earlier, and we know 5m is 6, and you notice all these numbers divide 6 as they ought to. Um, now in every case, you see there's always a number that has the maximum possible order. So here we've got order 1, here 5m is 2 and we've got something of order 2. Here, here we've got two things of order 4. Here we've got something of order 2. And here we've got something of order 6. So um, Euler's theorem gives 5m as the best possible exponent in these cases. So let's look at m equals 8. So we've got these numbers 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the ones co prime to 8 are just these numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7. And we know phi of 8 is equal to 4, so every element should have order dividing 4. And if we look at the orders, there are 1, that is, and this is order 2 because 7 squared is minus 1. So you might guess the elements 3 and 5 of order 4, but in fact they both have order 2. And now something has gone wrong. You see, in every previous example, we always found something of order equal to 5m. And here there's nothing of order less equal to 5m. So the order 
the orders are always, are always less than phi of m. Um, so Euler's theorem isn't actually always the best possible. Sometimes we can get a better exponent. Um, let's just do a couple more cases to finish off and see what's going on. So m equals 9, we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And you know, why did m equals 8 go wrong? Maybe something to do with it being a prime power. Um, well, let's check this prime power. So the numbers um, co-prime to 9 are just these numbers here. And let's work out their orders. Well, this one is order 1, and this one is order minus 1. And if we take 2, 4, 8, well, this is order um, 6, and um, this is order... Um, Um, this is 4 has order um, 3, and um, um, I'm getting a bit confused about what order 5 has. Um, 2, 4, 8, um, 8 times 2 is 7, that is order 3, and 5 has order 6 again. So 5m is again 6, and we see that there are two elements that of order 6, um, which is the maximum possible. And for m equals 10, this is still OK. Numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 7, 8, 9. And um, the numbers co-prime to 10 are 1, 3, 7, 9. And if we work out the orders, these orders are 1, 4, 4, and 2. So again, 5, 10 is 4. and We've got two elements of order four. So um, there seems to be often an element of order phi of m. Well, actually, um, it's often for small numbers. We'll see a bit later that for large numbers, this is actually a fairly rare phenomenon. Um, these elements are called primitive roots. Um, the reason for the name primitive root um, comes from um, roots in complex analysis. And I'll just sort of recall this. So in complex analysis, you remember the roots of unity lie in a circle. And if we take something like the sixth roots of unity, they all form a nice little hexagon. And if we take one of these roots here, then all other roots of unity are powers of this root. So if you call it z, then we get z squared, z cubed, z to the 4, z to the 5, and z to the 6. So z to the 6 equals 1. And you notice that modulo 7, this is exactly what's happening for the primitive root. So, um, for instance, if we take this number 3, we notice that 3 to the 6 is equal to 1. So 3 is a sixth root of 1, and it's a primitive sixth root of 1 because all the other roots are powers of it. Um, so... Um, we sometimes have primitive roots of numbers, and um, for, however, for other numbers like 8, we don't seem to get primitive roots. Um, so um, so we'll, we'll be examining exactly which numbers do or don't have primitive roots um, later, late, in, in a later lecture. Um, so here's another example where you um, don't get the best possible results. So, so, so suppose you take m equals 30, and we can count the number of um, things co-prime to 30, and we get 1, um, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29. So, so there are eight of them. So phi 30 is equal to 8. So x to the 8 is congruent to 1 modulo 30 if x 30 is equal to 1 by Euler's theorem. And is this the best possible? Well, no, it isn't. And we can see it isn't best possible without actually checking all these numbers, which would be a really tedious thing to do. What we notice is that x to the 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 5 because phi of 5 is equal to 4. And x squared is congruent to 1 modulo 3, because phi of 3 is equal to 2, and x 
to the 1 is congruent to 1 modulo 2 because 5, 2 is equal to 1. So x to the 4 is now congruent to 1 modulo 2, 3, and 5. And because 2, 3, and 5 are co-prime, we find that in fact x to the 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 30. So we can sometimes... Uh, so, so here's another case where we can do um, better than um, Euler's theorem. Um, now I'll get fi finish with a couple more applications of Euler's theorem. So first of all, with the following problem, let's find the last two digits of um, 7 to the 403. I don't know why you would want to find the last two digits of 7 to the power of 403, but here's how to do it if you want. Well, what we do is we notice that phi of 100 is equal to 40. That's because these are all numbers with last digit 1, 3, 7, or 9, and it's kind of obvious that there are 40 of these. Um, so, 7 to the 40 is congruent to 1 modulo 100 by Euler. And as we remarked, 40 isn't actually the best possible, um, but whatever, it's good enough for this case. So 7 to the 403 is congruent to 7 to the 40 to the power of 10 times 7 cubed, which is congruent to 7 cubed modulo 100, which is congruent to 343 modulo 100, so the last two digits of 7 to the 403 are just 43. Um, so uh, finally, we have a sort of common recreational maths problem, which is what is the last digit of, um, let's do 7 to the 7 to the 7 to the 7. Again, totally pointless, but it gives a sort of exercise in getting familiar with Euler's theorem. Well, we want to know what is this modulo 10. So we have 7 to the power of something, where something is this um, big rubbish here, and we want to know 7 to the something modulo 10. Well, in order to work out this modulo uh, 10, we want to know what is this something modulo phi of 10, because um, and we can just subtract multiples of phi of 10 from this. Now, phi of 10 is equal to 4. Um, and this something is um, 7 to the 7 to the 7, so we need to know what is this. Um, we need to know what is 7 to the 7 modulo phi of 4, which is equal to 2. Um, and now we can sort of work backwards. Um, we, we know 7 to the 7 is congruent to 1 modulo phi of 4. So you remember this is, this is just 2, because this is 7 is congruent to 1 modulo 2, so 7 to the 7 is congruent to 1 modulo 2. So now we want to figure out what is um, 7 to the 7 to the 7 modulo 4. Well, this is congruent to 7 to the 1 modulo 4, because 7 to the 7 is congruent to 1 modulo 2. So, so, um, so we can replace this 7 to the 7 by this 1 because of this. Um, which is just congruent to 3 modulo 4. So now we can work out what 7 to the 7 to the 7 to the 7 is. We know that this is congruent to 3 modulo 4. So um, this item here is congruent to 7 to the 3 modulo 10. Here we're using the fact that 7 to the 7 to the 7 is congruent to 3 modulo 4, which we've got here. Um, so all we have to do is to work out 7 cubed modulo 10, which is congruent to 343, which is congruent to 3 modulo 10. 
So the last digit of 7 to the 7 to the 7 to the 7 is, is 3. Um, needless to say, you can't do this by working out this number explicitly because this is um, insanely large. Um, so, uh, next lecture, I'm going to cover Wilson's theorem, which um, says something about what factorials are modulo a prime.